welcome all of you to celebrate this important day in the life of our Army, an important day in the life of Pete Corelli and his family. I'll introduce his family in just a moment. Before I do, I'd like to recognize other special guests who've joined us today for this, this special occasion. Dr. Gates, thank you for being here. Baroness Nicholson, thank you so much. Baroness Nicholson is a member of the European Parliament and longtime friend of the Corellis. It's great to have you. Chairman Mullen, Ms. Mullen. Uh, Ambassador Edelman, Dr. Chu, Admiral Ruffhead, Chief Vono, Chief Sullivan, thank you all so much for being here. And we've got some uh, former vice chiefs who are uh, here to celebrate th this occasion. Appreciate it in a way nobody else in this room does. Our most recently departed, Dick Cody. Uh, we all uh, said goodbye to Dick over the last several days and walked out of the Pentagon today at at noon, I want to thank him so much for his extraordinary service. Uh, General Keene, General Vitelli, uh, Secretary Brownlee, great to see you. Ray Dubois and Under Secretary Ford, uh, General McNabb. It's a great, great day, and it's it's wonderful that so many of y'all have come to share this this great occasion with uh, Pete Corelli and his family. We all know that service in our military, service in our Army, service in all of Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines is a, is a family affair. It's a far family partnership, and it's great to have today so many of the Corelli family here to, to join us in, in recognizing this accomplishment. We have uh, Beth Corelli, great to see you. Thank you for your partnership, and thank you for a lifetime of taking care of soldiers and their families as partner to Pete Corelli and your all's extraordinary service to our Army. We have uh, Audrey Corelli, Pete's mother, who's here from Seattle. It is wonderful to have you. Thank you for being here. The Corelli clan has come from uh, great distances to be here. Uh, Washington State, Pete's mother, and uh, his son, Peter, and his wife, Jen, and their little baby, 11-month-old baby girl, Amelia, are here from, from California. Great to have you. Uh, Aaron Corelli, who is, uh, lives only 30 miles from a great place. She's from Dallas, Texas, which is 30 miles from Fort Worth. It's great to have her, and son Patrick, who's here from Seattle. It is truly a, a privilege to share in this occasion. Congratulations to the entire Corelli family for this extraordinary accomplishment and, and recognition of a, of a lifetime of service to our country and, and to our Army. It's now my privilege to, to introduce the person who will speak at, at length about the career of, of General Corelli. Uh, this gentleman has served our nation in and out of uniform. He first served as an Air Force officer, then joined the Central Intelligence Agency, and he's the only career officer in the CIA's history to rise from entry-level employee to director of the CIA. He served on the National Security Council and as deputy national security advisor at the White House before becoming director of the CIA. Most recently, he served as president of Texas A&M University, and he continues to serve our nation today with great distinction as our 22nd Secretary of Defense. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Robert Gates. Pete, thank you for that uh, kind introduction. Thank you all for coming. It's a pleasure to attend this promotion and swearing in ceremony, although I have to admit it's, uh, it's also bittersweet. Bitter because uh, Pete Corelli, for the last 17 months, has been a constant source of support and friendship to me, and I will miss him. But sweet because I can think of no one more deserving of a fourth star and no one better prepared to take over the important post of Vice Chief of Staff of the Army. I first met General Corelli when I was in Baghdad as part of the Iraq study group. He was in charge of briefing us on possible military options for the future. This was in September 2006, when there seemed to be little cause for hope. I was very impressed by his depth of understanding, by his commanding knowledge of the battlefield, of tactics that had worked as well as those that had not. Of course, giving presentations on the tenets of counterinsurgency is a long way from Pete's roots in the military. He once told reporters that he had dreamed of commanding large mechanized formations across vast open deserts. Unfortunately, Pete was several wars too late to substitute for General Patton in North Africa. Still, Pete, a tanker by trade, 
spent four years in Germany in the late 1980s as part of the 3rd Armored Division, prepared to hold the line against a massive conventional offensive along the Fulda Gap. Less than two weeks after he arrived in Baghdad as commander of the 1st Cavalry Division, any notions of what kind of fight we were in were shattered. It was called Black Sunday, and eight soldiers were killed in Sadr City. Pete will never forget their names, and they are a stark reminder to him of the human costs of war and the gratitude and debt we owe all of our fighting men and women. By early 2004, General Corelli had come to believe that only by simultaneously providing jobs, services, reconstruction, and security could we attain our strategic objectives in Iraq. He sent a picture to one of his mentors of a little Iraqi girl sitting in a sewer, a symbol of the mission to take care of and secure the Iraqi people. It was an example of the old Clausewitz maxim to understand the war you are in and the implications that has for how you fight it. Pete's beliefs were only solidified on his second tour when he was in charge of all day-to-day -day operations as Corps Commander in Iraq. Given his experience, there are few commanders who better understand the nature of that fight, who know what the Army will need in coming years to fight the current conflicts and prepare for future ones. And in that preparation, Pete is unabashed in telling anyone who will listen that our men and women are our greatest asset. He cares deeply about the welfare of each and every soldier. He has been described by troops under him in many ways, as a father figure, a health advocate, a career advisor, and even a marriage counselor. His passion is obvious to everyone who meets him. In our time together, he has helped me understand what impact my actions will ha have on the war fighters, the men and women who, in his words, walk the street every day looking the devil in the eye. General Corelli has been their staunchest advocate, and I have made better decisions because of him. I know that he will bring that same intensity to his new role. As I told a gathering last week, as long as there is a single soldier in harm's way, as long as there is a single Army family in need, Pete will never rest. The Army is undergoing its largest expansion and transformation in more than a generation, and it is doing so while under incredible stress. With his keen understanding of the 21st century battlefield and the threats we may face in the future, and his deep and abiding love of every soldier, Pete will be an incredibly valuable addition to the Army leadership. And I thank you for your ongoing service. I also want to recognize Pete's wife, Beth, who has often been described as a saint by those who know her. We don't know whether that has to do with being married to Pete for 30 plus years or what. But for many years, she has played an important role in organizations devoted to helping our military families. Wherever the Corellis have been stationed, Beth has made a positive and lasting impact on the community. I know she'll continue to support our soldiers and their families in any way she can. Thank you, Beth. General, it's been an honor working with you. Congratulations on your promotion and good luck in your new assignment. At this time, Lieutenant General Corelli, Mrs. Corelli, Peter, Aaron, Patrick, and Mrs. Therese Corelli, please come forward. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain seated. Attention orders. The President of the United States has reposed special trust and confidence in the patriotism, valor, fidelity, and abilities of Peter W. Corelli. In view of these qualities and his demonstrated potential for increased responsibility, he is therefore promoted in the United States Army to the rank of General. By order of the Secretary of the Army, signed George W. Casey, Jr., General, United States Army, Chief of Staff.
Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. You may take your seats. At this time, the Secretary of the Army will now administer the oath of office. Thank you, Mrs. Corelli, as well. At this time, Secretary Guerin will present the Vice Chief of Staff of the Army flag to General Corelli. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the 32nd Vice Chief of Staff of the Army, General Pete Corelli. Well, this is absolutely amazing. Um, you can't prepare yourself for something like this. And I'm not into correcting chaplains, but I must. <laughs> Chaplain Portland is not in Washington. <laughs> it is in Oregon. And I could not go home tonight if I didn't fix that. <laughs> Secretary Gates, Secretary Guerin, Admiral Mullen, Mrs. Mullen, Admiral Ruffhead, Ambassador Edelman, Honorable Dr. Chu, Under Secretary Ford, Honorable Brownlee, Mr. Dubois, General Vono, General Sullivan, General Tellelli, General Keene, and General Cody, General Griffin, General Jowan. Colleagues, friends, and confidence, thank you for being here. It means so much to Beth and I. Secretary Gates, sir, it's been the highest honor to have served at your side. What you and Becky have meant to Beth and I cannot be measured. You've given us unfettered access into what strategic leadership and partnership done right looks like. You lead by example and have shown all of us inside and outside defense how vision, accountability, and confidence can move government. Few people are willing to reach across the department aisle for the sake of the nation. I thank you, sir, for your trust. I thank you, sir, for your confidence. And I thank you for this opportunity. Secretary Guerin, thank you kindly, sir, for those remarks. I look forward to serving as part of your team. Your commitment to the soldiers and their families are not only evident in your words, but through your deeds. At a time of such tremendous change, your compassionate leadership has been an example to the Army and to their families. Baroness Nicholson, your leadership and vision brought hope to Iraq. Your tenacious engagement of the Ministry of Health to provide basic medical services to all Iraqis is a tribute not only to your commitment, but to the world's commitment to a better Iraq. I'd like to give a special welcome to my sister, Janie Parkerson,
who's watching today via the magic of an internet webcast uh, in DuPont, Washington. Um, Janie could not make the trip, uh, but I know I have no bigger supporter um, than my sis. And to the Cables, the Ferrises, the Kirbys, and the rest of my family that travel such great distances to be here, I thank you. Beth, you, Mom, Peter, Jen, Aaron, and Patrick have lived through the countless moves and have endured so much. You've always been willing to forgive my type anus. <laughs> these flowers being presented are just a small token for all that you have done these many years. To see Amelia, our granddaughter, here today is to see our future. There is such a sense of pride in my heart to have watched our family grow, mature, and live their dreams. And it, when, it hurts when I think of all the times that I was not around. Beth, you have been the rock I've leaned on. You have listened when the toll seemed too great. You have picked up the burden when I could not be there, when lives were forever torn apart by the realities of war. And you've been quick to remind me that I'm just Pete Corelli, <laughs> that I can take out the trash like any other man, wash the dishes, whatever. I love you, and I thank you. <laughs> General Cody, I, I stand in awe of your accomplishments. You've left some big shoes to fill. Your impact is reflected by your commitment to service, your family's commitment to service, your incredible willpower has forced an unbelievable transformation of our army mid-stride of two conflicts. Whether it's leading from the front across the berm in desert storm, flying over the mountains of Af Afghanistan, haggling through the halls of this building, or pulling the only hole-in-one ever registered by a Corelli out of the hole before I even had a chance to see it. <laughs> You have been a true friend and mentor. <laughs> Thank you, sir. That's, a, that's true. Generations of Corellis have tried, and I finally made it. It'll be a year tomorrow. <laughs> a year tomorrow when he did the dastardly deed. When I look back over 36 years of service to our nation, I can't help but feel humbled by today's events. Yet I'm looking forward to the challenge that comes with this appointment. An occasion such as today demands a reflection of those lessons and events that have shaped the core of who I am as a soldier, as a husband, and as a father. I think about the lessons grounded me as a young officer marching into my first motor pool um, at Fort Lewis, Washington. My first boss, Major General Tom Garrett, at that time Captain Garrett. It was two non-commissioned officers who worked for him, First Sergeant Morris and Sergeant First Class Grainer, who had that gut level instinct to understand the value of an investment of time, experience, and wisdom to a young eager officer. And what a return that investment could possibly produce. I think about the countless training exercises and opportunities leading young troopers and future leaders and learning from them, whether in the cold and wet of Yakima or we're defending an IV line near Antelope Mountain at Fort Hood or attacking across 15 Tango and Ho Hohenfels, or in the classrooms of West Point, they taught me that leadership, competence, and accountability count. I think about one of my first assignments as a young flag officer when the walls of this building collapsed under the weight of an unspeakable act of terrorism. From the inside, I witnessed countless souls pick themselves up, tend to the wounded, bury the fallen, dust themselves off, and with grim determination, silently vow that this shall not stand. I think about the soldiers, the Marines, the airmen, the sailors, and our partners who I have had the privilege of serving these last few years in Iraq. 
I'm so proud of them. They've shown themselves more resilient than I, more adaptable than I, and more focused than I, and having been forged in the fires and complexity of modern combat. They are wiser, they are smarter, and they are more understanding of the second and third order effects than we standing today here could have ever been. I draw my inspiration from them, knowing that in their capable hands lay the future of this great nation. It is a nation that learns every day with fresh insight of the brilliance of our founding fathers. If I've learned anything in the last year working for Secretary Gates, it's the wisdom of these wise men who, as Samuelton Huntington wrote, saw with such clarity the proper subordination of a competent professional military to the ends of policy as determined by civilian authority. Whether it's during the formulation of policy or during the execution of policy, when civilian and military leadership collectively work with a unity of purpose, the outcome is profound. But when we decide to counter that simple principle for the sake of the personality of politics, it is clear to me that our soldiers and their families and our nation suffer. Know this, I will work with a sense of purpose with our civilian authorities, and I will work with a sense of purpose with those who represent our three million constituents to create solutions that do not impede the needs of our troops serving abroad, that do not impede their families who wait patiently on the home front, and that do not impede the Army's transformation. We cannot afford to. For over 200 years, our Army has been in a constant state of change, proactively responding to the global context on behalf of this great nation. Yet today, that context is changing at a faster rate than at any time in modern history. And though we institutionally see ourselves as leaders of change, it would be wise to remember how our military culture shapes our experiences. These ships shifts form a conversion of basic assumptions we've grown to accept as facts. And that's the challenge. Sir Basil Hart once remarked, the only thing harder than getting a new idea into the military mind is to get an old one out. Yet I'm confident in the road ahead. Just as First Sergeant Morris and Sergeant Greenier invested in a young lieutenant and his beautiful bride some 30 odd years ago, Beth and I believe we have an obligation to invest in our soldiers and their families today so they are ready for the future. Thank you all for taking time out of your busy day to be here with us today. An extra special thanks to Army Protocol who makes this all happen and looks so effortlessly uh, for coordinating all our activities. They did an absolutely magnificent job. Army strong. <laughs>